It looked like a balloon drifting down, until it wasn't. A man near Pond Creek, Oklahoma, heard what sounded like a dirt bike engine screaming overhead. When he looked up, he saw a twin-engine airplane spinning nose down out of the sky. No radio call, no warning, just silence and falling metal. That plane carried Bill Lauber, his wife Christine, and their daughter Reagan. So what invisible force ripped that airplane apart? And how could a calm cross-country flight turn catastrophic without a single word on the radio? Let's unpack what really happened and the unseen chain of decisions that made this tragedy inevitable. On March 17, 2022, 58-year-old William Bill Lauber took off from Mineral Wells, Texas, in his vintage Piper PA-30 Twin Comanche. It's a fast, unpressurized twin, capable but demanding. With him were Christine, also 58, and their 21-year-old daughter, Reagan, heading home to Nebraska. Bill was licensed for multi-engine flight, but not instrument rated, fine for clear sky travel, but not for cloud or darkness. He had about 275 hours total time, which is decent experience yet still early in the learning curve. After takeoff, he climbed from 8,500 feet up to 16,500 feet, well above the oxygen required altitude. And that's where the trouble began. Above 15,000 feet, the air gets dangerously thin, but the warning signs are almost invisible. It's not the moment that kills you. It's the quiet, creeping decisions that seem perfectly normal, until they aren't. For more than an hour, the Comanche cruised north steadily. No radio contact required or expected. Then the ADS-B track began to drift, speed bleeding from 200 knots to under 100, the path wobbling east and west as if the pilot couldn't quite settle on a heading. Moments later, data gone. On the ground, a witness filmed the final seconds, the airplane spinning violently right hand nose down, the tail already separated, pieces of wing tumbling after it. The engine still roared until impact. Investigators later found no fire, no explosion, no mechanical failure, just in-flight breakup from overwhelming aerodynamic loads. The wings and tip tanks were scattered over a thousand feet apart, and not once did the pilot call for help. No mayday, no transponder change, nothing. That's what's really chilling. The entire event unfolded in silence, suggesting that whatever happened took hold long before control was visibly lost. At those altitudes, the real enemy isn't the airplane, it's the atmosphere. FAA rules, FAR 91.211, are clear. Pilots must use oxygen above 14,000 feet, and passengers must be provided oxygen above 15,000. The reason? The higher you go, the less oxygen your brain gets, and your time of useful consciousness can drop to just a few minutes. The PA-30's oxygen bottle was found intact, but there were no masks or cannulas anywhere. The pilot's mechanic later admitted he'd seen Bill use oxygen only once. So for nearly 90 minutes, the lobbers were breathing air with barely half the oxygen their bodies needed. Hypoxia doesn't feel like suffocation. It feels fine. You get confident, even euphoric, while your reasoning collapses. It's the most deceptive state a pilot can experience. Gradually, judgment fades, vision narrows, and small corrections become big mistakes. That slow drift in the flight track, the sluggish altitude changes, that's classic hypoxia creeping in, eroding focus, coordination, and awareness until the pilot is essentially flying in a dream. And once that haze took hold, the next danger waiting above those cloud tops would finish what hypoxia started. Now, here's where everything truly spiraled, both literally and mentally. Even though the surface weather that day was clear, visual meteorological conditions, or VMC, what was happening up there around 16,000 feet told a very different story. Satellite and Doppler data later showed cloud tops stretching up to 21,000 feet, with turbulence and light icing zones between 15 and 19,000. In other words, the upper atmosphere wasn't calm blue sky. It was a thick, gray soup, 
waiting to trap any VFR pilot who dared to climb into it. And that's exactly what likely happened. Bill might have been cruising along on top of one cloud layer, or trying to stay just clear, but as hypoxia blurred his thinking, he probably didn't notice when the horizon disappeared entirely. One minute you're above the haze, the next you're inside it, with no visible reference to tell you what's level or what's a gentle bank. Here's the brutal truth. For pilots without instrument training, that's one of the most unforgiving traps in aviation. The inner ear starts lying to you. That's the leans, the somatographic illusion, all those sneaky vestibular tricks that make your body swear you're level when you're not. Combine that with a fading brain starved of oxygen, and your chances of correctly switching to instruments drop to almost zero. And statistically, the numbers are terrifying. Between 75% and 86% of VFR into IMC accidents end fatally. Once you lose sight of the horizon, the odds of surviving without strong instrument skills are almost non-existent. In the Lauber case, that deadly cocktail was probably already brewing. Hypoxia dulled Bill's senses, clouds erased his horizon, and confusion took the controls. Within seconds, the aircraft's attitude likely changed faster than he could interpret. The perfect storm for spatial disorientation. And once a multi-engine aircraft like a twin Comanche starts an uncontrolled descent, it's not a gentle ride down. It's a violent spiral that builds speed faster than you can even process what's happening. When you look at the wreckage photos, the violence is unmistakable. Pieces of wings and tip tanks flung hundreds of feet apart. The tail section gone before impact. This wasn't a slow descent. It was a full-blown structural breakup in midair. The Piper PA-30 Twin Comanche, for all its reliability, was never designed to survive that kind of aerodynamic punishment. It's not spin certified, and the manufacturer's pilot operating handbook explicitly prohibits acrobatics or spins. That's not just a suggestion. That's the engineers saying, this airframe can't take it. Here's why it's such a deadly scenario in twins. Unlike single engine planes, the yawing and rolling forces in a twin spin are multiplied. Once the aircraft starts rotating, asymmetric thrust, fuel slosh, and gyroscopic loads can tear components apart in seconds. There's no gentle recovery from that, especially if the pilot isn't consciously fighting it because he's disoriented or unconscious. NTSB investigators found upward bent wings, twisted fractures, and tail impact marks, all consistent with overload failure, meaning the plane literally pulled itself apart under forces far beyond its design limits. That's not an engine failure, not a stall break. That's the sound barrier of pilot control giving way. And remember, at that point the plane was descending near vertical, engines still running, fuel probably unbalanced from turbulence and bank angle. The PA-30 multiple fuel cells, mains, auxiliary, and tip tanks require deliberate management. Under duress, that's more workload, more distraction, and more opportunity for imbalance. In short, once the twin Comanche slipped out of control, the loads were simply too much for the airframe to bear. The breakup wasn't the cause of the accident. It was the final result of everything that went wrong before it. When you strip away the mystery, what remains here isn't about mechanical failure or bad luck. It's about how human limits can quietly line up against you. The first takeaway, and it's a big one, is that there's a huge difference between what's legal and what's physiologically safe. Sure, regulations technically allow flight up to 12,500 feet for short durations without oxygen, but your body doesn't care about those numbers. Oxygen deprivation starts affecting coordination and vision even around 10,000 feet. And at 16,000 feet, you're gambling with awareness itself. That's why oxygen discipline matters. Always use supplemental oxygen above 12,500 feet. Better yet, use a pulse oximeter to monitor your actual saturation. It's cheap, it's easy, and it could literally be the reason you make it home. Second, mission planning mindset. Just because your airplane can climb to 17,000 feet doesn't mean you should. Think about your oxygen supply, how long it'll last, and your escape plan if conditions turn. Plan for descent margins and safe altitudes long before you need them. Third, instrument proficiency. Even if you never plan to file IFR, basic instrument skills can save your life. 
A few hours of hood time every few months can make the difference between panic and recovery when the horizon disappears. And finally, respect the invisible traps of VFR into IMC. That's not just a weather mistake, it's a mindset mistake. If you ever find yourself tempted to just sneak through that layer, remember, every pilot who crashed thought the same thing. Bill, Christine, and Regan Lauber trusted the skies. They weren't reckless. They weren't thrill-seekers. They were simply unaware of how fast thin air and disorientation can stack the odds against you. Their tragedy reminds us that aviation isn't always about power or skill. Sometimes, it's about humility and respect for what we can't see. So next time you fly, remember this story. Not because it's tragic, but because it's preventable. Fly smart, stay sharp, and never underestimate the invisible dangers above.